Hey, it's Scott Petrick with another episode of the Brown Zone Zone Coverage Podcast. The Browns had an enormous letdown in Miami and now have to face the ultra-talented Buffalo Bills, possibly in a blizzard. If that's not enough to occupy their attention, Deshaun Watson returned to practice Wednesday. Here, as always, to discuss everything is Dave Chodowski of Go, the WKYC Morning News. How are you, Chud? Scott, I'm good. It's one of those days where I'm glad I'm a West Sider. Uh, I'm not dealing with uh, all the snow on the east side as we're taping this on Thursday morning. Um, so that that's a blessing. But speaking of snow, before we get to the Dolphins game, and, and quite frankly, I don't even know if I want to talk about it. I know we have to, but that was just ridiculous. But anyway, uh, I think the, the lead stories here uh, today with us are Deshaun Watson and the game this coming Sunday. I think you got to get right to the issue with the snow. And, you know, there's reports coming out on uh, Twitter this morning. And, yeah, I, I got to ask you, will it even be a snowball? I mean, do you yeah. think they might move this game? I, I do. I, I do. And I was hesitant to say that, you know, even Wednesday, um, even though that was a topic in Berea, just because, you know, the NFL doesn't want to move the game. Buffalo doesn't want the game to be moved. All its fans want to go. Uh, so you have those aspects. Plus, most games get played. And you never know with the weather. It can be projected to be terrible and it winds up not being that bad. But as we get closer to Sunday and the snow has started in the Buffalo area and the projection, projections continue to be, like, astronomical, then, yeah, more and yeah. more I believe that I believe that there's a good chance. And I don't, I'm not ready to put a number on it. I don't know if it's 50-50. I don't know if it's that high. But I think there is a legitimate chance this game gets moved, which would be really interesting. And, <laughs> we'd have so, you know, there'd be so many more – facets to talk about if the game is in fact moved but when you're talking about six feet of snow in a five-day window the logistics just get out of hand yeah because you're not talking about inches you're talking about feet uh the nfl the according to the the tweet i saw uh, it was someone from espn i believe um i don't know if there's been more out there um since then but uh basically it, it's saying that the nfl has until late friday to make this decision uh, they're monitoring the situation. And and you have to think, you know, my first thought was was that, you know, if there's that much snow, it just makes it difficult to try to have the field ready for the game and, and also to have fans inside there. But, it, you know, it, you mentioned to me before we started, you brought up a lot of good points about just getting people there. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right about the field. You'd have to figure out a, where, a place to put all that snow. But Buffalo is kind of used to doing that. But you also have to get the, st the stands ready, right, for fans to sit, assuming you're allowing fans. But to me, the bigger issue is how do you get people there? And when I say people, I mean officials, the Browns, although you would assume the Browns would be able to figure out a way to get there. Although Sean McDermott, the Bills coach, said they have contingency plans if they can't get from to their practice facility, like, right? Because everybody lives wherever. And if guys can't get to the practice facility – Today and Friday, how do they handle that? So it, it's a travel thing. It's officials, it's stadium workers, it's the police that need to be there. It's are you taking police away from when they should be on the highways because there's going to be accidents on the highway? Are the highways shut down, right, so no one can get there? I mean, there's a lot that goes into it besides can you make 120 yards, you know, playable for the game. So where would the possible place be? Would it be the what I heard was Detroit and then – you know, Buffalo plays Detroit on Thanksgiving right. Day. Well, here's the here's one of the huge factors is, you know, my the NFL normally would just delay the game, right, and play it Monday right. or Tuesday because they don't want to take it out of Buffalo for, you know, money reasons, competitive advantage reasons. But, Detroit, but Buffalo is scheduled to play Thursday on Thanksgiving, and they don't move Thanksgiving games. So let's call that a – whatever, a locked-in factor. So then you can't move the game. They can't play Monday, Thursday. They have to go Sunday, Thursday. So it means you have to play Sunday. Uh, Detroit seems to me to make the most sense. It's close for both teams. You're right. De or Buffalo would just be staying there. So if they chose to, they could just stay in Detroit for five or six days. Um, Detroit is not at home this weekend. So it makes sense, but – you know, I'm sure there are other options. I haven't gone through all the other 
you know, options. I don't know, Pittsburgh's at home this week. I know I could check into that, but um, it just seems – or Detroit seems to make the most sense. It's inside a dome. It's an easy trip for the Browns. It's not a hard trip for Buffalo. Um, so I think that would be the default, but by no means has the league said it would be Detroit. Yeah, it's funny. You sit and at first thought, you're like, well, Bill's Mafia, the Bills don't want to lose their home game. But really, if you ended up in Detroit, I mean, I think the Browns' chances are better in a snowball in Buffalo than they are on the turf in Detroit against this team. Yeah, I- I'm with you. I-, I mean, Buffalo, I know Buffalo's lost two in a row, right? But their last time I looked, they were an eight-and-a-half point favorite or at some point yeah. when I looked this week. Um, I mean, that w- you know, that was before, I think, before the weather forecast, the weather predictions. Um but the point is, Buffalo's really talented. I don't care that they lost two in a row. They should have beat Minnesota last week. So they may be struggling, but they are extremely talented. And we could go to their roster and point out a bunch of studs on that team. And I think they're motivated to stop this two-game skid. So you throw all those factors. The Browns are reeling. Um, you know, the Browns. Whatever, however you want to label the situation, the uncertainty of quarterback. I mean, we know who's playing quarterback, but now you have this Deshaun Watson factor lingering. Uh, LeBron's coming off, you know, a terrible game in Miami. All that together means on a normal track, the Bills have a huge advantage. Doesn't mean the Browns can't win, but the Bills have a huge advantage. If you start adding crazy elements into the game and you have the Nick Chubb factor, then yeah, I think I would think a snow game yeah, would help the Browns. I think it levels the playing field. Now that doesn't mean the Browns are necessarily going there and win. And you know, Buffalo can run the ball too. And Josh Allen, if you know, Buffalo could run Josh Allen forty times and win the game. But I, I think the Browns' chances, like you said, are better in a compromised game than you know, pristine conditions inside Ford Field. Yeah, breaking down this Bills team. I mean, obviously they have one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. They don't rely on their running backs too much, right? He, he's like their best rusher. Uh, they have, um, you know, Diggs and Gabe Davis on the outside. Uh, defensively, they're very good. It's hard to believe that they, they're coming off a two-game losing streak in what many people are calling the game of the year, yeah. uh, all, you know, against Minnesota. Just an incredible way to lose a game. Oh, yeah. I mean, anybody who watched it, you know, you, there's a million huge plays just in the last five minutes, Right. I originally caught the last I don't know, however many minutes on TV, plus overtime, and then I've gone back and watched the game. But they lose 33-30 uh, to Minnesota and in overtime. And there's a goal line. There's, first of all, there's the potentially the best catch ever uh, by Justin Jefferson, right? It's like 14-18. Yeah. He goes up one-handed. The Bills guy has two hands on the ball, and somehow Jefferson makes this crazy one-handed catch. Then they get stuffed at the goal line. Then Josh Allen fumbles into the end zone and the Vikings recover. Then it goes to overtime, right? And then I think, I think it went to overtime. And then, yeah, no, the, right? the Bills come Bills down and the field get a goal, field right? Goal. Yeah, they yeah. kick the field goal. And there's yeah. a bad call on that, right? Davis is juggling a ball on the sideline. They don't review it. Yep. They tie the game. Minnesota goes ahead. And then Allen throws a pick in the red zone. So to end the game. So just a million things. Yeah. But, you know, you come away still going, well, Buffalo's a really good team and really talented. The week before, they'd lost to the Jets on the road. Um, they had turnovers in that game. That's been a theme for them. Turnovers and struggling in the second half to score touchdowns the last few weeks. But, yeah, they're, they're immensely talented. And you're right about their running game. Josh Allen's the main runner. But Singletary still runs it. I mean, he's got more carries just at every many yards is Allen. But as a team, and they, that includes Allen, they've run the ball more than their opponents. So – in the old days, the last couple of years, when Brian Dayball was the coordinator with Buffalo, it was like almost all passing. But now there's at least some balance there. It's not complete balance, but there's some threat of the running game. You mentioned Diggs. Davis flies. They got a tight end in Knox. McKenzie's quick, too. Um, they just got a lot of dudes. And then on defense, they got Von Miller, who has eight sacks. They got some big bodies on the D-line. They had a couple of linebackers in Milano and Edmonds. They got Jordan Poirier might come back, and he's a, re, you know, the Browns, he played the Browns for a while back in the day. Um, it's a playmaker, a bunch of interceptions. The defense is a lot different when he's in and he's out, and he's battling, been battling injuries. So they got guys everywhere. And it, it's a huge challenge. I mean, I, I haven't looked at the odds in the last week, 
but they remain among the Super Bowl favorites, or they did at least until this Minnesota loss. That's because they're that talented. And you know, Josh Allen, who's one of the top, whatever, two, three quarterbacks in the league. No question. Uh, speaking of quarterbacks, the big story, Deshaun Watson back at practice yesterday. What are your thoughts on uh, you know him being back and, and how they're divvying up the reps and – you know, I know it's practice, but you know, I got to ask, how did he look? And you know, you know, just bring, give us the inside of what it was like yesterday. Yeah, I'll start with just him on the field, right? That's the first time he's been out with his teammates. Uh, it's the first time we've seen him since August 30th, when he the suspension started. Now he's been back in the building since October 10th, so he's been in meetings, but he hasn't been allowed to attend practice or games. He's worked with the strength and conditioning coach, but. Yeah, the coaches haven't had their hands on him on the field, right? He hasn't – they haven't been coaching him on the field since August 30th. So that's a long time. So he's back out there. Um, you know, it, you can't tell anything in the individual parts we're watching, right? He's throwing the ball. You know, obviously he looks fine throwing the ball. He's a really good quarterback. It's just like when we watched him in training camp, right? He looked really good because he is really good. He's talented. He's got a good arm, and he runs really well. Now – the interesting part to me is how he fits from a repetition standpoint. And Kevin Stefanski has said, over, you know, repeated himself the last few days. Number one priority is getting Jacoby Brissett ready to play, which is what it should be, right? Because they have two games left. And even if the Browns are out of the playoffs, I think it would be a disservice to the team to say we're just getting Deshaun Watson ready to play two weeks from now. But the Bronx still have playoff hopes, right? They're not out of it at three and six, even though it's a tremendous long shot. The point is you have to get Jacoby Brissett ready. And that has to be the number one goal. And, uh, you know, it makes sense for Stefanski to state that. But it's not going to be all about Jacoby Brissett because there is. We have to get Deshaun Watson ready. He's going to start December 4th in Houston. And then, theoretically, the last six games of the year, if he stays healthy. So how do you do both at the same time? And this has been an issue since the offseason, right? We knew a suspension was coming for Deshaun Watson. Nobody knew how long it was going to be. But throughout the offseason, at the start of training camp, it was all Deshaun Watson with the first team. And then at some point, it switched to Jacoby Reset after that first preseason game. So they're kind of back to where they were. Is okay, how do you do this? How do you get both guys ready? Uh, and I think it'll mean extra... I think practice will be longer. I think there might be an extra session for Deshaun Watson, whether it's – I think an extra session or two for Deshaun Watson with the game plan, right? These are the plays we're running. Now, I don't know if he'll be out there with the starters because, you can, you know, you don't want to wear out your starters, but he'll be running the same plays, maybe with the second team or the scout team. I think when it's special teams periods and the quarterbacks are on the side throwing, you'll see a lot of Deshaun Watson throwing to Amari Cooper – and Donna Peoples-Jones and David Njoku when he's healthy because you need to get some rhythm back with those guys. The question is, does that detract from Jacoby Brissett at all? And if it does, is it at a level that affects his preparation? And Stefanski said no, Brissett said no, but I think you need to see how it plays out. And if there is, even if there's one period that Jason Watson gets that Jacoby Brissett doesn't, I understand why the Browns would do it, but it would be, at least at some level, a disservice to, I think, the preparation for Sunday. Now, you can you see that when sometimes a quarterback's injured, right? And you need to get two guys ready. But quarterbacks don't like that, right? Peyton Manning is famous for not giving any reps to the backup. And I would assume Deshaun Watson's similar. When Deshaun Watson becomes his quarterback, he's not going to want Jacoby Brissett taking some of his reps. They're limited and precious in number. So I think that bears watching. Kevin Stefanski would not get into any specifics uh, about how he's going to split up those quarterback reps. What I can say is in the individual period, which is not significant in this when we talk about this, but he was third. It was Jacoby Rousset, Josh Dobbs, Deshaun Watson, right? Your one, two, and then the Watson jumped ahead of Kellen Mond, who's been, you know, the number three all year, but hasn't been active. So, um, my guess is when they get to the actual team drills, is Watson just taking reps away from Dobbs or is he taking some away from Brissett? And how does that wind up affecting this team on game day?
Well, that was going to be my next question. Do you think that they can balance this act and, and, and get through this okay? Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, I think they'll – it's interesting, Judd. I, I think they will. I think Stefanski is smart. I think he's approaching this the right way. And – not trying to compromise Jacoby Brissett's preparation at all. But not only do you have the repetition number issue, you also have maybe like a, a psychological impact with w the transition of power is coming, but it's not there yet. So Deshaun Watson's a big figure. He looms large. And I know he's been in the locker room, you know, the last whatever, three or four weeks. And we've seen him um, – actually, it's been more than a month, October 10th. So um, – and we've seen him come in and out of the locker room just in the time that we're in there. Uh, and he's in the meeting rooms with Brissett. But it's different when you're on the field. It's different when you see him throw. It's different if he's under center. So, you know, some guys are asked about that. Stefanski said, hey, these two guys are good friends. They're two professionals. They'll handle it fine. Nick Chubb said it wouldn't be awkward at all. But I, I think that's something that bears watching too is just – how does this? How does the whole team handle it? Because, yes, you know they've been fine with Watson, despite all the off-season stuff, you know, off-field stuff, right? His teammates have seen to embrace him, but he hasn't been there, right? He hasn't been through this nine-game struggle. Jacoby Brissett has been. Brissett's played pretty well, and he's become respected and a team leader. And I think even more so since he's been the starter. So. Uh, you know, you're just curious when, you know, the season feels like it's hanging by a thread anyway because they're three and six and coming off the Miami game. Is this just something else that the Browns struggle to handle? Um, and, and I don't, I don't have the answer to that. Should I would think that both things could affect them. Both things don't necessarily have to affect them, but it bears watching if that makes sense. Yeah. I had to go back to something we were talking about before I was able to look this up. Uh, it looks like the Bills are still the favorite to win the Super Bowl at. Okay. Four to one. Uh, you got the Chiefs at five to one. Philadelphia is uh, mm -hmm. twenty-one to four. And then okay. uh, you got the Niners and Vikings right after that. So then the Ravens. So I mean, the bottom line is, even with those two losses, the Bills are still uh, projected. You know, still the Super Bowl favorite. Right now, the Browns' odds are. I believe eighty to one. Right, that doesn't uh, seem I'll, high I'll, enough. Yeah, I mean they're like I'll a double. four and a half. ESPN's got them like four point five percent to make the playoffs. So hundred hundred to one. Okay, um, which just shows you right. You can't sleep on the bill. If you just looked at their last couple scores, you'd be oh okay. And Allen storm some picks, and he had a fumble. All that's fine, and maybe it does allow an opportunity for the Browns to win. They Buffalo does have some injuries. Um, and obviously they haven't been playing their best football, but the Bills are still, yeah, they're still the cream of the crop in the league. And the Browns are going, well, I was going to say the Browns are going into their house. Regardless, the Browns are going to play them Sunday somewhere. And I, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's a tougher matchup for the Browns in the league. Yeah. hundred to one Browns. So uh, there you have it. Put your money down. Uh, any, yeah. Yeah. Go put it down. Right. I mean, there was a, there was a period there where they were like 16 to one after the Watson uh, signing, I think, or uh, trade. I, yeah. I, I know that it was much, much lower at one point, but um, all right. Anything else on Watson before we revisit that debacle in Miami? Um, just that I should probably say he did not talk to the reporters. The hope yeah. is he talked The hope is he talks next week. Uh, you would think the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, just because I think the Browns, you know, he, he could wait and talk to Houston week, but then there'd just be so much to cover, right? What have you been doing? You know, did you learn anything in treatment? All those issues. And the focus wouldn't be just on the Houston game. And, you know, so at least my thought is, hopefully from a media perspective is, we split this up over a couple of weeks uh, just because there's going to be so many things, so many angles to address with him uh, before he gets back on the field against Houston. No doubt. All right, let's get to that game. Fresh off a bye, fresh off that Bengals win, all the good feelings that you have as a Browns fan and Kerr Plunk. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Um, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I mean, you, didn't, you picked against them, right? You picked Miami because you, you said yeah. the Browns needed to show it to you, and you couldn't have been more right, Judd. And I, I thought the Browns were going to build on that, and they didn't. I guess my question to you is, how surprised are you? Not that they lost, but it was as bad as it was. Oh, I thought they were going to cover the spread. I, yeah. I thought four and a half for sure. I picked them to lose by three. So, yeah, I thought they were going to lose, but not by that much. I didn't think that they would just get hammered. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I had them winning. I thought it would be a high-scoring good game. But the biggest disappointment to me, and let me know if you disagree, is how bad the defense was. I they It had <laughs> made strides, right, yeah. against Baltimore. It was better, like noticeably better. Against Cincinnati, it played its best game. It was able to get to Joe Burrow. And against Miami, and I know Miami's got a really good scheme, and Mike McDaniel's a really good offensive coach, and maybe just a really good coach, period, because that team's playing well. But the Browns had no answers, and that's troubling on so many levels. One of them, one of which is, and we're going to talk to coordinator Joe Woods today, and I know everybody, you know, Joe Woods is the scapegoat, right? If you go on Twitter, if you go on my text chains, it's a lot about Joe Woods, and I get that. But – to me, it's really interesting and troubling that they play really well or they play the better games against familiar opponents. So why does it take seeing a team twice a year to have really good game plans and to be able to adjust on the field? And John Johnson III talked about this. He says, yeah, we're not good. We need to be better adjusting during games. You know, he mentioned halftime adjustments. He said our defense has to figure stuff out. We're seeing a new scheme. And I said, well, you know, and he said, yeah, it's it's a, it's a different when we face AFC North opponents to when we don't. And I asked him, is that coaching or players? And he says it's both, but it feels like an indictment on the coaches, right? That they don't have the players ready for what they're seeing. And if that's not the case, if they do and the players just can't figure it out until they're on the field, like seeing guys for the first time, like that's hugely a problem. Because you see new teams all the time. You play 17 games, you play six in the division, right? You can't expect just familiarity to be the <laughs> only way you can play. And it's obviously it's not just the answer because they played New England two years in a row and got waxed by them twice. So the step by back, the step back by the defense um, is a terrible sign. And I'm not sure it's something this team can recover from. Because I don't know, I mean – do you have any faith that they're going to figure it out against Josh Allen and the Bills? No. No, I don't. And, you know, you had mentioned that, you know, I needed them to show me. And, and I use that line all the time, right? Right. right. But it, it, it was also the fact that I, I just I, – I, I, it was that being a Clevelander thing. This was okay. the typical, you know, they come out on Monday night, do that to the Bengals, and you just had a feeling that they would come back and let you down. But 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 I didn't see it being let down by that much. And and I'm glad you brought up the defense because that's just – Scott, listen, we can talk about Jacoby Brissett and we can talk about Stefanski and we can talk about – but we've hammered this home on this podcast all year long. I continue to ask you and you continue to try to analyze it. This defense is just – it. I can't remember a defense. I remember hearing out of training camp how great they were going to yeah. be, how many you know talented guys they had on the defense. I can't remember such a, a defense or a, a position, a group of players that was touted so highly in a long time that has been this much of a, a, a failure and a letdown as this defense. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, I flash back to 2019 a little bit, right? They're coming off um, that first Baker season and, you know, the Hugh was fired the year before and they played better. They won some games and Freddie was the head, you know, Freddie Kitchens was the head coach. There were high expectations, right? Odell had come, and then the Browns were bad. But that was an overall letdown, right? This is the defense, by and large. And and you're right. And the thing is, Chad, when I look at it and try to break it down, like I still think they have really good corners, and I think they have a lot of depth at corner. And it's not Denzel Ward and Greg Newsom and Martin Emerson Jr. Those aren't the guys that are the problem. But And I don't think Miles Garrett's a problem, and I don't think Jadavion Clowney's a problem. But as a unit, right, so I just named five guys, right? And obviously that's just under half the defense. But my point is they have some talent on that defense, and they still do. And I think they have some really good individual pieces. But 
for whatever reason, and I think there's multiple reasons, the unit has not come close to being the sum of its parts, right? And part of that's the D tackles being so bad. And we've talked about them since March is they need D tackles. They need D tackles. And the Browns didn't ignore D tackle because they signed Taven Bryan in the offseason and they drafted Perry and Winfrey in the fourth round. But these guys have not played up to expectations. And they were dominated against Miami. And that was a huge part of the problem. Not the only part of the problem. Not the only problem, but a huge part of the problem. And yeah, the linebackers have had injuries, right? So, like, we can signal things out, single things out. But you're right. Overall, this unit with talent has underachieved immensely. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I know there's more. There's plenty of people to blame. But I don't know how they get I, that figured out. And I, I don't think you can just say it's all D tackles because it feels bigger than that to me. Yeah, I'm glad you made that point because, believe me, I don't want anyone to think that we've never touted the Browns to be a, have a good season and they let us down. I mean, listen, that's happened a lot, right, where we figured they'd be a playoff contender or much better, and they haven't. And, and we've also seen a situation where we thought a quarterback might be the guy to turn them around. So I'm glad you made that point. It's just the – defensive unit like that it, it's it's just incredible like and also how baffling it is that you can't figure it out it's yeah. just it's they're just easily run upon <clears throat> Miami you mentioned I mean it, it's it's incredible uh as a unit how disappointing they've been and I want to bring up um going back I think it was Monday and you know we always talk about the generic uh things you get out of the locker room and to be fair I'm always critical of that because you're always like, oh, well, they're just saying that because that's what they have to say, right? <laughs> but I got to go to John Johnson and, and what he said. And, and I'm, I'm glad he said it because he's being truthful, but I want to analyze the truth. And he said something along the lines of, you know, they're a little uptight. Now it's time to yeah. cut it loose. You know, he said they have nothing to play for at, at this point. So, you know, go out and have some fun or something along or play our game. Well, all right. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to make fun of him for what he said, but I have to like go into the the base of that and think. Well, why are we waiting till now? Right. Like what? Like what happened? Like you're why didn't you cut it loose like right away? <laughs> I'm, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, what's, I, yeah, I what's going on so. here? Yeah, it's it's a fair question. It's a good question. You know, I, I think now it's grasping for straws. It's okay. What haven't we done? What can we try? And I guess John Johnson the third sees. Some hesitance, and he said that he used that word hesitance from the guys. And you know, Miles Garrett referred to being on their heels because Miami's the speed of Miami's motions and pre snap movement caught the Browns off guard a little bit. They knew that they were going to do it, they weren't used to that uh, num that amount of speed. And like I mentioned, right, it's something that unfamiliarity factor. Um, but so I guess when Johnson watches a film, he sees guys. I guess not comfortable with what they're doing. So then they hesitate, and that means they're not getting off blocks or they're not swarming to the ball, right? All those things that the, the, the coaches and players talk about. Beating your block, um, gap integrity, 11 guys to the ball. And if you're hesitant in a second slow, then you probably get dominated by the guy in front of you, and it leads to untouched 24-yard run touch, touchdown runs, right? So I, I think that's what Johnson's trying to get at. And he means, hey, just play and just go out and try to get out of your own head. But you're right. None of these things should take until week 11 to figure out. Um, there shouldn't be the fall off from the Bengals' performance to the Miami performance. And, yeah, Miami had a bunch of good plays, and Miami's quarterback's playing out of his mind, and they can run and they can throw, all of that. But – they should not be able to run for 195 yards. It's just too easy. And even if your focus is we're not going to get beat by Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, which was obviously the focus because those guys did not wreck the game, your run defense cannot be so bad that Miami does whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And that's been the problem. It was a problem against the Chargers, right? The Browns invite teams like that to run because, you know, run's not going to kill you like the past. Well, the run kills you like the pass if you give up seven yards of carry, if they go for 24-yard touchdown runs. Right? Like, there has to be some level of resistance, and the Browns have not been able to present that too many times this year. And 
and that's why at this point they're searching for answers and John Johnson the third saying stuff like we just need to have fun we can't be uptight we have nothing to lose <laughs> well I mean I get what he's saying like psychologically but I know that that doesn't make fans feel any better yeah do you think things will be different though with and, and listen all fairness to Jacoby Brissett and we've talked yeah. about it, he's played better than probably a lot of people thought but he's a backup quarterback but it's pretty clear like with Miami you stop the running game and, and you stop the Browns, right? So right, 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 right. is the thought that when Watson does come back that he, he, you won't be able to just stop the running game, that, that then we'll tr- truly see what this offense can be? So that is like the million-dollar question to me. And you make a great point about – and Miami's not the only team, right? New England did the same thing. Said, we're not going to let Nick Chubb kill us. And when you don't, when the defense takes that away – and whether or not Kevin Stefanski abandons that too quickly, which he didn't in Miami. I didn't think I did. He ran the ball 14 times the first half for 30 yards. So it wasn't working. Uh, but so then that puts all the pressure on the passing game. And whether you deal that deal with that by throwing first and hoping to catch them, you know, paying so much attention to the run, or you just get in a situation where you have to throw it because there's too many guys at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that puts pressure on Jacoby Brissett. It puts pressure on your receivers. And, you, you know, you have – one great one, one pretty good one in Don Fields Jones, and then there's a big fall off, right? So, so yes, you're exactly right that that's an issue. And if Deshaun Watson were your quarterback, you would feel better. You'd say, hey, yeah, we can compete through the air, maybe not, maybe just as well as we can on the ground, right? That's what the Browns are looking for. So, I, I think you make a really good point there. Now, I also think that from a huge, big picture perspective, the Browns front office looks at it and says, if we have a dominant quarterback, an elite quarterback, and we have a running game, then we can dictate how we want to play. We can score a bunch of points. We can keep up with Miami. So therefore, it doesn't matter if we give up more points, right? Maybe if we get a lead and we jump on teams, then they can't run against us. And it's not maybe, like that's the plan. Go out, score a bunch of points early, Make the other team throw the ball and then unleash Miles Garrett and Jadavian Clowney. And, and you have all these cornerbacks that you love. I get that. And I, I'm not even saying that's a wrong strategy. Where it goes off the tracks is when you don't get a big lead, the other team can run the ball on you because you don't have any really good D tackles and your linebacker core is suspect and injured, right? Like that, that, the, the big picture strategy is tougher to execute when you don't have that elite quarterback. And I I do think that factors into it. And I think that's a big factor. And I think the final six games are going to be huge to tell where this team goes. Um, But having said all that, it doesn't account for giving up a bunch of run yards, right? Deshaun Watson's not going to fix the run defense, but maybe he fixes how the overall game is played. (laughs) And that makes a difference. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the joke, I mean, I've said it. Uh, a lot. It's all over Twitter. You know, Deshaun Watson can't play defense. Right. So, I mean, that's uh, – is uh, is there any con- – quickly here because yeah. we got to get moving, but is there any concern with Miles Garrett at all? I don't think so. I mean, he's, mm-hmm. he's not on the injury report. He rested yesterday. I know he wasn't in, out there a ton against Miami. I think it was his lowest percentage snaps of the season. Kevin Spansky said that was a heat thing. They, they were trying to rotate guys as much as possible to deal with the heat. Now, he didn't have an impact on the game. Part of that's Tua. Part of that is they had a good left tackle. Um, Tua gets the ball out of his hands in a hurry. Part of it is the way the game was going, how Miami ran the ball. Um, but certainly, it was disappointing that coming off the pass rush that they had against the Bengals, they were not able to generate any of that. And obviously, Miles Garrett's part of that because he's your best pass rusher. So you're looking at a team right now, Scott, you look at their resume, three and six, and, and really, I mean, the Bengals' win was impressive, no doubt. Obviously, beating the Steelers, regardless of what they are at the time, that's big, right? But right. Carolina, I guess the bottom line is it's not an amazing resume when it comes to, you know, you haven't really, I mean, the Bengals maybe, I mean, they went to the Super Bowl last year, right? But it's not like you don't have a lot of huge chips there in the resume of teams that you've beaten. No, and there's like, Cincinnati's the only – Maybe Pittsburgh. They played well against Pittsburgh. Um, like games you walk away feeling really good about. Carolina, they needed a late field goal. They tried to give it away at the end. And then there's a bunch of losses, right? Like, yeah, there's 
there's not a lot to hang your hat on. And I do, again, I think that's something that's worrisome. Now, there's time, and I do think we'll feel differently, or at least we'll have a different perspective after Deshaun Watson plays for six games. I, we'll, we'll get a better view on, okay, how does Kevin Stefanski's offense work when you have an elite quarterback, a quarterback that can run? Now, Jacoby Brissett's made plenty of plays scrambling, but that's different than being able to run RPOs. It's different than being able to call quarterback runs, right? You see it with Lamar Jackson. You see it with Josh Allen. You see it with Justin Fields. Deshaun Watson has a lot of those same capabilities, and that changes an offense. So, you know, I don't think we can get a complete judgment, make a complete judgment of this team until you, we see how it functions with Deshaun Watson. But that's a that's kind of a long-term view. If you just look at this season, you can't get past nine games in, Big disappointment, should have won more than it has, hasn't, and the defense is a huge disappointment. Anything else before we get to prediction time? No, I don't think so. Does that does that Watson discussion make sense? You know what I mean? Like, I think it changes everything, but it doesn't change everything. You know what I mean? It doesn't change totally. individual things. Yeah. Oh, no, we – Listen, I think we even talked about that at the beginning of the year. Just yeah. j- just putting him out there doesn't automatically make you, you know, a, a contender. It's got to be it's got to be earned, it's got to be proven. Right. But he might erase or cover up some of the weaknesses. Right? At least at least that's the hope. Right? That's the hope when you have an elite quarterback. And we'll have to see if he plays like an elite quarterback, right? He hasn't played in 2 years. Um but, you know, Aaron Rodgers forever has made up for not having enough pieces around him. Uh, the question is, can Deshaun Watson do that? Yeah, no doubt. I think, you know, when it comes to predictions, I, I'm not going to give a score. I just think we come back on Twitter if we want to put a score out there. I, I think it's too hard to predict a score with, with the snow and not knowing for sure where they're playing. Do you agree? I do, except I got two scores, Chad. I got a, oh, I got a, okay. snow, I got a snow game score, and then I got a <laughs> neutral site score. Okay. All right. All right. So if they score, if they play in the snow, I'm going to go 18-12 Buffalo. All right. No, I'm sorry. I, let me correct that. That's what I originally wrote down, and then I started doing some math. We're going to go no extra points, but a couple of two-point conversions. I'm going to go 22-16 Buffalo. Okay. And then if they play at a neutral site, give me 30-24 Buffalo. So the, wow. so, the, so the spread's the same, but yeah, I, I, I just more points for everybody. So you got the Browns covering then because it's it's I saw it at eight right yeah, now. It was eight and a half. It just kind of because it's hard to cover a bunch of points. You know, you've talked about it. you get the backdoor cover, you get a late touchdown. You know, I do think the Browns are gonna be motivated. And I do think the Browns the offense is still capable of scoring points. Now Buffalo's got a good defense, but with injuries, it's not impenetrable. I thought the Buffalo's defense was outstanding earlier in the year. I think it's shown some cracks the last couple of weeks. Now, I don't know if the Browns can take advantage of those, but I think they have a chance. So, for now, I'm saying the Browns hang around. Okay. Uh, I'll give you – I did write down a score, and it actually was a score that hit the over-under right on the nose. There you go. Um, I'm just going to throw out a generic score. And I never usually do this, but just the generic score of 28-14, to 14, Buffalo. Okay. Um, but, again, I'm – you know, if it's in the Snow Bowl, I, I, it – I agree with you. I I do definitely think two different scores is a logical way to go. The bottom line is, uh, putting scores aside, uh, I think Buffalo wins. And uh, I think I'm five and four now, and you're four and five. I've caught you. You were ahead of me. I've taken over. Yeah, that's bad. Um, Yeah, I mean, (laughs) before I let you go, Chad, just like what what percentage would you put on the Browns winning this game, right? Like, of course, every team in this league has a chance, or most teams in this league have a chance to win. Eight and a mm-hmm. half isn't the biggest spread ever, but right. You know, I mean, is it is that a ten percent chance the Browns win? Do you give them a little more than that? Well, so like the Miami game, for example, going back, I, I thought Miami was going to win, but I also told you I saw very, I saw ways where the Browns could win the game. I didn't think you were crazy to pick the Browns, yeah. and I only picked them to win by three, the Dolphins. So I would have said like Miami, I would have gone like sixty forty, right? Yeah. I would have given the Browns like a forty percent chance. Um, this one here, man, like if they played in Detroit, like I I really honestly believe you made a great point. I just believe if they played in Detroit on a neutral field on that turf, I just, I don't give them 
much, I don't know. I mean, I guess the Browns offense could be a little more dangerous, but I, I'm just thinking about that Bills offense against that Browns defense on turf in Detroit or wherever, you know, if they played indoors. Right. Uh, I, I honestly believe they have a better chance in the snow. Um, slows them down. So um, percentage-wise, man, I would probably say 10 to 15% chance the Browns yep. win. I'm right with you. I am. And I I think I said this earlier. The fact that the Bills have lost two in a row, I think, is oh. bad for the Browns, right? They're motivated. Totally. That means so much in this league. Teams needing a win. I mean, they're falling behind in their division. I, I think that bodes poorly for the Browns. So I, I'm right there with you. 10 to 15. And if they play in a snow globe, maybe it goes up a little bit. There you go. Yep. Cool. Hey, Chad, I really appreciate the time, buddy. Um, we'll do this again. We'll try to squeeze this one in next week before Thanksgiving. I know it'll be a crazy week, but I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, everyone, for listening. You can read all my work at brownzone.com, and this has been another episode of the Zone Coverage Podcast.